starting my timer. <laughs> okay, let's go on there. Uh, hi, I'm Kelsey. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Kelsey. And my sobriety date is 7 8 12. Um, just had 11 years this summer, which is not an easy time to get sober, let me tell you. Um, that was my favorite time to drink. So, um, yeah, I really didn't want to do this because I have social anxiety issues, but um, I think it's really important to pass the message on. And it's not about me. It's not about my ego. It's about trying to help other people get sober, right? And um, I'm sure a lot of people struggle with that, you know, when they're in their drinking and stuff. So um, I just did a lot of praying and meditating before I came here. And um, the message that was given to me was I'm God's vessel. And I hope that my creator could speak through me to help somebody someday get sober and stay sober. And um I'm really grateful that I'm, you know, where we are asked to do these things because it, it's a good way to show service and show that we are trying to um, be there for one another. And so uh, what brought me here, <laughs> well, first of all, I'm going to go back to when I was a child. When I was a child, I really liked the taste of beer from a very early age, I liked to sip off my mom's beer and she would let me, she would let me take sips off of her beer. She was like, well, you know, I don't have anything else for you to drink. We would take very long road trips. <laughs> yeah, I, I know, right. Um, good parenting <laughs> skills here, um, but that's not what it's about. Anyways, so um, we would, we lived in Eastern Washington and most of my family was located over here. So we would drive long distances to see my family. Um, she was married to my father at that time. And uh, there was a lot of alcoholism in the home. And um, all my earliest childhood memories was arguing and yelling and screaming. And that's pretty much all I remember from an early age. Uh, I was, very in turmoil, you know, from an early age. And uh, she finally left him uh, quickly. So I, a lot of the trauma didn't have to stick for too long, right? And I was able to just be me and her for a long time. And she met someone else later on in my, in my eight, later years and she married him. And so, that was a much better relationship, but there was still alcoholism going on in that in in our home. But I didn't really pay much attention to it. I just kind of I became kind of like a stubborn child, and I was really not happy that she had found someone else. It was more about like I felt abandoned and and about me, right? And I wasn't happy for them. And that's kind of how I acted throughout my teen years. You know, it wasn't really about them. It was about me. So it, it already started, the alcoholism started at an early age. And I remember when I first took my first drink, I got really drunk, like immediately from the very first time. And I like, went ahead and just made out with some other woman like right away the first day you know and this is not stuff i do this is not this is not how i normally am i have social anxiety as i said and so i i don't just approach people and go up to them and start talking to them immediately it takes time for me to get to know people and my first drink was like it gave me confidence it was liquid courage and so as soon as I drank after that, I was on, it was on, like I was drinking and drinking and drinking. And, uh, by the age of 18, I was a full blown alcoholic and I would get up right in the morning and drink from the beginning of the day to the end of the day. And I would drink a fifth a day and it was, it was pretty out of control. And at that point, like 
my judgment was out the window and I was doing everything like um, harder stuff and everything because uh, when I'm drunk, it, it just doesn't, you don't, I don't think about anything like I just want to do um, whatever. It doesn't matter. So I used to pride myself on being an alcoholic and I would brag about it. And there was this song when I was, you know, younger that was like, I'm an alcoholic. And I was like, yeah, I was like so excited to <laughs> sing and dance with that. And I would make everybody drink. I'd be like, you drink, you drink, you drink. And that was like the theme with me. Like everyone knew that I was going to make everybody get drunk, like <laughs> force them. Like what? <laughs> like it should be your choice. Right. Um, but so I thought it was a cool thing. And so anyways, it was getting pretty out of control. And I ended up um, getting in a, a serious, well, I tried to quit drinking for a temporary amount of time, but I was doing uh, marijuana maintenance, which does not work. I'm just going to say, like, if you're, if you're an alcoholic like me, it, nothing works. Like, you can try all sorts of different things and it's not going to work. So, um, I ended up having a broken relationship cause that's a lot of the times why I would drink more heavily. And I ended up getting very drunk and I was driving my stepfather's car. So it wasn't even my vehicle. And I hit a pedestrian with his truck. And, um, so I tried to deny it as we do. We try to say, get me out of this and, and I'll tell you whatever I need to, to get out of it. And, um, they, uh, pulled me over and gave me the sobriety test. And I called my mommy cause that's, I didn't, I wanted somebody to save me, you know, get me out of this. And she showed up and he went over to the police officer went over to her and I passed the field sobriety stuff that they make you do, you know, ABCs, all that stuff. And he was like, I think your daughter has a problem because when you're that far into your alcoholism and you're acting normal when you have, and I blew as well. Um, I forgot to add that I blew and it was very high and he's like, there's something wrong, like seriously wrong here with her. Uh, and that was like the first sign that my family had gotten that how bad off I was, you know? And so I did go to jail. And then after that, um, I tried to avoid dealing with my stuff, going to court and I stopped making it to court and it ended up being, um, that they, they took me, uh, they said they would take me out of, out of jail. If I did treatment, they would, uh, not make me do as much time. So I got to go home for a period of time and I was facing serious charges. It was, it could have been, um, it could have been a felony. So Nobody pressed charges against me and I was really lucky. Um, it was not a major, I'm not downplaying it, but it wasn't a major, like anybody had passed or, you know, was majorly injured that had to go to the hospital or anything. So, um, but we, so I, I pretty much was facing like, should I do treatment or should I be in jail? And I'm sorry, but like this person here is like, a sensitive person. Like I don't, I cannot deal with jail. <laughs> like that is not the right place for me. Like, and I've known it from the beginning, you know? And, um, so I did avoid it for some time. And they were like, my parents were like, you need to go to treatment. And I'd be like, yeah, I called them yesterday and I got a bed lined up. It's going to happen in a couple weeks, but I was totally lying, you know, completely. And finally they caught on because as people do, they catch on to your lies. And, and I all, at least was able to start to admit like, you know, 
I seriously did do this to this person. This seriously happened like enough denying and denial. Cause I was denying so hard that I was believing my own lies about it. And so they, um, they finally, they, one night they're like, Oh, well, you're going to like in two days or whatever. And I was like, uh, okay. And then I just like snuck out and I hid under the, this is really embarrassing. I hid under their house <laughs> and slept with a blanket all night and was like, I'm just going to hide around here on the property and maybe they will just forget about me and all this stuff. And, but the next day I wake up feeling like shit and like, what am I doing? Like, this is crazy, right? And so they, I just go over to them and I'm just like, you know what? Let's go. This is, this is ridiculous. Like I can't keep running from the stuff that I keep, the trouble that I keep causing and the wreckage that I keep causing. Um, it's gonna follow me everywhere I go. And so we, we made the trip over to fancy old sundown ranch and, um, it was like a vacation. I kind of miss it at times. No. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> um, it was, it was pretty cool. Like my, my, you know, like I said, I touched on like how there was alcoholism in my home and there, there was, but I had blame for a lot of things. Right. And I blamed other people's alcoholism and other people's addictions on them and, or well, on the cause of my addiction and really the only person that takes that drink or that whatever it is, is me. It's, it's my choice. And so I can't really blame anybody for my circumstances. You know, um, it, it doesn't make any sense. Really. It's actually pretty delusional. And I had, you know, my eyes were opened while the counselor talked to me, she's like, do you want people to think this way about your family? Do you want them to, to, because they got me there. They got me sober. They, I mean, they helped me get sober, but my willingness kept me sober and they helped pay for treatment and all this stuff. And my mom came to the family thing. She came for a visit and she she worked really hard to get me there and she really loved and cared about me and there were nights where i wouldn't come home and she'd be searching for me in her car because she was worried that i was dead or in jail or in the hospital and so i put her through a lot and so I, I kind of tried to change my attitude from then on. Like, I, I don't really need to blame anybody for my situation. Like it's, it's my choice to get that my choices that leads me to this. And so they made me get into, um, Oxford. They made me sign up for some house interviews and, um, when I got back, they, they made me, uh, go to jail again. So that was kind of an interesting way to start off my sobriety, but, um, my lawyer did not show up. He, we had a set date and everything and he just wasn't there. And so I had to spend a little extra time in there and um, oh, and I forgot that I also at treatment, I wanted to try marijuana maintenance again. I thought that was a smart idea. I thought it was a smart idea. Wait a second. 
hmm, let's think here. Didn't I try that before? Oh yeah, it didn't work. And so they made me stay the extended stay. Yeah, I got that. Hmm, because I'm a true alcoholic, as they say. Um, but anyways, so they, I signed up for these interviews and I was denied to the first house and my confidence level was not, you know, very good at that point. So it was kind of hard, a hard blow, but uh, the next house accepted me and they're like, I told them that I wasn't accepted. And that was the first time that I felt like people really cared about me again. Um, because when you're out there, you're running around with people that are not good for you and that don't have your best interest at heart. And so it was really good to feel a little bit uplifted. And they were like, we want you, we accept you. We want you to, to live with us. And I, and it made me feel really good. And so there was like a time where I also had been in a relationship and I wanted to drink over it because I got my heart broken for the first time in sobriety and the house came together and took a group conscious that I needed more support. And then I needed to be around that house a lot more instead of out on my own. And so they made sure that they did a house meeting and told me that I needed to make it to their meetings because I was working later and um, I took a bus home. So they were like, you need to get a ride so you can be here on time for the meeting. And I was really mad because, you know, when I get first, when I first got sober, I had defensiveness like everywhere. Like that was how I was. I was always really defensive because I thought, you know, oh, you're attacking me and I feel cornered. And so I've got to like protect myself because that's how it was before. Right. And now, and then afterwards though, I realized that they were just trying to help. They were rooting for me. They were just helping me. They just wanted to support me and they really wanted me to, to stick with it, to stay sober. And so, that was my first lesson in that over the years i've gotten a lot of lessons like that like i continually need to hear these things from people like that's what we're here for and i think it's been coming up for me what a good friend is or a good um fellow aa member is is that we call each other out on these um on our shit. and so um because if, if we're keeping our mouth shut, there's no room for progress. There's no room to grow. There's no room to become a healthier, healthier you. And there's, there's limitations, right? Like, I don't want to, like, give too much unsolicited advice. But when it comes to program, I think that's very important. It's very important to, to talk to each other about this stuff because a lot of that stuff is what has kept me sober. And I, um, I think that it's, it's important to pass the message on. It's been a little bit harder for me with college and stuff. And, and Lara's been like really pushing me hard to be part of all this stuff. Uh, uh, uh. Um, but, and I think that's, that's, that's what we're here for. That's what's important that we have to do that. And so I try, I've at least after doing the steps and like, I got, I did get a spiritual experience of like trying to change and be better and have, have those principles in my in my life and have faith but um i think that it's also like it's about unity and one of my biggest things has been for when i'm in in um 
in sobriety is that trying to make sure that everybody gets together because I've been noticing over the years and I've been hearing tall tales about how things used to be, right? Like how connected everyone was and they would all show up for these things at Vaspa Park. I don't even know. Like huge thing. <laughs> like, what is this? And like the, you know, inner group was, uh, um, the, the picnics were very large and I'm just hoping like with the zoom and stuff. And I know I've been enjoying it a little bit too much myself and she knows that, <laughs> but, um, I just, I think it's important for us to, to be face to face. We're humans. Humans are social animals. We need each other. We need each other. We need that touch, that physical touch. We need to look each other in the eye. We need to say, you know, how are you doing? And just do check-ins. And I think that it's important to just keep that legacy going. And I, so that's been one of my biggest things is like to continue that because I, you know, I like, I like that old school way. I kind of wish some of this internet crap <laughs> didn't, didn't exist sometimes, honestly. And, um, it's been good though, because there's been a serious illness around. And so I understand that, but I'm just saying that like, it's important for each other to, you know, connect with, each other like that. And, um, but I think, um, but I, I have, I have done the steps. I was going to say, I have to cover that because I always forget to, cause I always do the drunk log too long. I don't know why, but, um, I, for me, I have had to diligently do them over and over and over, like, because I've been a lazy alcoholic for a really long time. And sometimes the 10th step, I forget to do a nightly one. Oh, shock. You know, people do that occasionally. I can show my humanity. I can show my imperfections, right? But so the reason why I always continuously go back to doing a fourth step is that I need that reminder. Sometimes I drift away with school, college, you know, life, work, family. And so I've continuously done the steps over and over. I know a lot of people uh, that have had a lot more sobriety than me do 10, 11, 12 sometimes. But for me right now, I just got to keep doing it all. Like I got to do it all. And, um, I do still like volunteer to, to be a sponsor and stuff like that. But, um, not a lot of people have made it with me, but I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. Like, I can't let that discourage me. Right. Like I'm, as long as I put it myself out there and cause this is what keeps it. This is what keeps that sobriety is to keep passing, passing that message on to other people. And I think when I give it away, I feel like happier. Well, I know I feel happier inside and the, that's how I get those princ principles in my life. Um, five minutes. five minutes. Okay. Uh, like acceptance and patience, <laughs> right? I mean, there's some pretty willful. Yeah. Uh, for me, I've gained a lot. I've gained a lot more, uh, with my family life. So as I was saying, like, um, there, I also caused turmoil in the, the home and I have two little sisters, they're 20 and 21 and I'm 38. So big age gap. So it's basically kind of like they're, well, I look at them as my kids too, in a way, but I can't, you know, take them in or anything like that. But so they saw a lot of anger and um, turmoil in the home. And so now I've been able to kind of 
be their steady rock. If that makes sense. Less emotional stuff happening. I've bring in, bringing them to Al-Anon and I also attend Al-Anon as well. And um, just showing up for them, committing to things and actually following through with them for them and being supportive when they need to talk to me about stuff. And I also tell them everything because <laughs> I want them to know what it was like and how, what, what I was getting into because I want to prevent them from ever wanting to do what I have done. And so far it's worked. My sister, one of my sisters has told me, she said, um, I don't want to end up like you. <laughs> so she is getting the message. So I was able to pass that along pretty well. And I don't know. It's, it's really cool to have such a good relationship and I have acceptance in, in, in my family because yes, there's some alcoholism going on around there. And, um, I do have an estranged father and I, and I don't talk to him, but I've made peace with that. Like I'm, I'm growing, I'm becoming more accepting of that. And, um, I just want like, the main, one of the main reasons that brought me here is I just wanted a connection with people and I wanted to get spirit, like into the spirit of things, like find a God, you know, and I really just, I wanted these, the promises, I wanted them to come true into my life. And I think that actually all this stuff has, has checked off for me. And no matter how far down the scale you have, we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. I mean, when I go into these things and, and now I have more confidence, I'm able to, to speak and come up here, even though it's, it's been uncomfortable. Like that's what life is. It's a journey and it's going to feel uncomfortable. And if it's not uncomfortable, you're not growing. You're not going anywhere. So I'd rather, you know, grow. I don't know. It's sounds better to me. Um, I'm a lot happier and I don't feel useless. I don't have self pity. I don't, I don't lose interest in selfish things and gain interest to, in our fellows, you know, self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people of an, an economic insecurity will leave us. We will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. Like so much of this stuff is, I was just reading this today and I was like, you know, when you go to speak, you like start to think really hard about like what all this means. I don't know. It's crazy. You're really trying to like read into it and like go, wow, because we read this repetitively at every meeting, like what, well, right? But you're not paying attention. It's, it's tunnel vision. Um, I don't know. And I've also, I dropped out of high school at an early age. I have gotten my diploma in high school. And, um, I also got my AA in science and now I'm working on my BA in, uh, environmental. So I'm doing things, but it's because I showed up. I had integrity. I'm, I'm trying to be like honest. I'm trying to like do all these things in my life. Right. Um, and just because I, I, I showed up and suit up and I don't like, like, Fail. Like I used to call in sick to things so much. Like I never wanted to um, follow through with anything. I'm just trying to be more impeccable with that, you know, and it's, it shows like the work that I've done. It's like got me a lot of really good things. So I'm glad to be here. Is this the end or what? Uh, okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.